Good morning. I'm Reverend Erica Richmond, your parish minister. As we bear witness to those joys and concerns of our community, let us settle into a time of meditation, of prayer, of pause. I invite you to take a deep breath and allow yourself the quiet of this moment. This is a prayer for hot summer days. Those days where the humidity wraps around us like a weighted blanket and we are instantly drenched. Even in the stickiness, those are good days. The gnats and the mosquitoes don't bother us. We barely notice their bites. Instead, we are sun-kissed and happy. We are sweaty but content. Reassured that there is no to-do list we must tackle. We notice children screaming past us, running desperately towards water. These kinds of days remind us of graduations, sitting in hot fields, watching children proudly walk across the stage. For those who are in that celebration passage this weekend, this season, we say amen. As you blossom, may you always know you can call this place home. These kinds of days remind us of family reunions, the ones that are joyous and the ones that are fraught. For anniversaries, for birthdays, for milestones, we celebrate. As each of us reunites with friends and family during this strange reopening time, May we be gentle with ourselves and with one another. Reconnecting is tender work. These kind of summer days often smell of sweetness, of flowers past bloom now wilting in the hot sun. That smell can be heavy with nostalgia. One single breeze can remind us of loved ones now gone. For those who are in that passage of grief and loss this season, we say amen. May you always carry your memories close. These summer days sometimes feel suffocating and we are restless in our own skin. We might try to find coolness in cold showers, in a nearby lake, on a coastal walk. But some days we still feel trapped. For those struggling with mental health issues, be that depression, loneliness, anxiety, or alienation. We pray for moments of relief and solace. For all that this season brings, the laughter, the languish, may we find moments of renewal, of quiet street blocks, of summer rain, 
of ice cream trucks that pull right up to our houses. Let us settle in to two minutes of silence together. We again say amen. When do you really let yourself play? What is your history, your life story with play? What play did you engage in as a child? And what play do you engage in now as an adult? A man, a professor of some esteem, was invited by two 10-year-old girls whom he knew well to play a game of Scrabble. Now, this professor had played a fair amount of Scrabble in his life. Some might even say he played a mean game of Scrabble. The two girls, in contrast, were complete novices. So the professor saw this as an opportunity to teach. He would teach them the rules and some of the strategy of Scrabble. He would be their Scrabble mentor. And so he outlined the game. The two 10-year-old girls loved the basic situation, taking turns at putting down letters in an organized way on the board, with sets of letters interlocking with other sets in crossword fashion, making interesting designs. But they had no interest at all in keeping score. And the idea of limiting themselves to real, actual words, words that can be found in the dictionary, bored them. They very quickly and effortlessly, with no overt discussion at all, and despite the man's initial protests, developed their own rules and strategy. Their unstated but obvious goal on each turn was to put down the longest, funniest nonsense word they could, using as many letters as possible from their rack, combined with at least one letter from the board. Now, for them, it had to follow the rules of English phonology, or as they would have put it, it had to sound like it could be a word, but it couldn't be an actual word. The object was not to score points, but to make each other laugh and laugh they did. Sometimes one would challenge the other's word, asking for a definition, and the other would offer a hysterical definition that somehow seemed to fit the way the word sounded. And then they would laugh even harder. The man realized as he pulled back and watched them and began to laugh along with them that his way of playing was something like what we usually call work. Their way of playing was play. And isn't that the point after all? 
What if you and I entertained more in life for the sheer pleasure of it? Bending the rules, not for personal gain, but for the chance to laugh. This is how I met Bill Gardner. Bill isn't with us this morning. He is off attending his granddaughter's graduation from high school, but he has given me permission to embarrass him a bit. Bill and Peggy Gardner are members of First Parish, and I have been minister here for 12 years, but I've known Bill for more than 30 as a colleague, and Bill is now retired from the Unitarian Universalist ministry. But Bill served congregations in Washington, Nashville, Philadelphia, and was the national co-director of social justice at the Unitarian Universalist Association for years. At first impression, Bill Gardner can appear a bit formal, even intimidating. He is tall and generally presents himself with everything in place. Bill listens before speaking. I first met Bill when I was invited to join a Unitarian Universalist minister's study group, the Greenfield Group. Bill was a member. There are about 30 ministers who meet twice a year for three days at a time to present papers and discuss on a selected theme. This group has been in business for more than 100 years. It has its way of doing things. Those ways are even codified in what are called the disciplines. When I arrived to the group, it seemed that Bill knew all the disciplines. One of the disciplines is that on the second night of the three days, the group is supposed to engage in what is called a change of pace, an activity led by a member that is supposed to be unrelated to the theme. Once I was told the group watched a movie on logging together. So my expectations were low. That gathering, we were meeting in a monastery, complete with a chapel, dining room, rooms, bathrooms on each floor, a kitchen with a walk-in freezer, and an enormous dark cellar which of course none of us had been in until that night. The change of pace a member told us this night was sardines. Sardines is a version of hide and seek in which the person who is it hides and the rest of the players try to find them. Once found, each player is to join them in the hiding place. The last person to find the hiding place is it is the rotten pig, the it for the next round. In the round, I remember Bill was it. I found him along with a handful of other ministers in a shower stall in the men's section of the monastery. Remember, there are about 30 ministers playing this game and all but five or six are men ministers. This was some time ago. And all of them have some professional attainment. I was 26 or 27 at the time, but I squished right in with the rest of them in the shower stall. And we were very quiet. It felt and it was both safe and deliciously out of character. And in time, others found and joined us until there were about 25 of us in and tumbling out of the shower stall. Bill, silent, and the one deepest in the crush of humanity. All at once, out of the quiet, Bill says somewhat loudly, excuse me, excuse me, and starts pushing his way out of the people and the shower stall. And when he breaks free of us, he makes a dash down the hall. This is my memory and my first impressions of Bill Gardner, a tall dashing man running down a monastery hallway with two dozen other ministers in hot pursuit. We had found our it and we weren't about to let him go. 
And as we ran, we giggled. No one more than Bill who proceeded to find a second hiding place. As I recall, it was in the monastery cellar. Bill changed the rules on us. Sardines does not include the it becoming a moving target. But in changing the rules, in doing something simply for the fun of it, we all entered a deeper level of play, a deeper level of joy. Don't let Bill Gardner's appearance fool you. Bill Gardner knows how to play. And so does every one of us. Let me invite you into my living room in my condo in East Arlington. It is a second floor walk up, very comfortable. If you were to walk in, you might not think anything was amiss or strange. Sherry, the first slide, please. Then I might invite you to look a little closer. Next slide, Sherry. And if you still didn't notice, I might invite you to look up. The next slide, Sherry. Five years ago, I spent time studying at the University of Oxford in England. It was an august environment and included having all my meals in the same dining hall many of you would recognize from the Harry Potter movies. Yes, it really does look like that. But what impressed me even more than the dining hall were the carvings, hundreds and thousands of them sprinkled inside and outside on the buildings set above eye level. Next slide, Sherry. You might look up and notice some little guy watching you, carved into an alcove, a column, alongside an arch. You might be seeking out a book in the stacks and look up and notice this fellow. Next slide, Sherry. It is as if a child in the car beside you at the stoplight had made a face and you had to make a face back and you both laughed. Next slide. I might at the great seat of learning, the Bodleian Library at Oxford, reading and getting a bit bleary eyed, I might look up and notice this one. Next slide, Sherry. Oxford University has its roots in medieval Christianity. Its oldest surviving colleges date from the 13th and 14th centuries. They were founded to improve the learning of the clergy. The quadrangle, so familiar in university architecture, evolved from the monastic cloister. And so it would be natural that the buildings at Oxford were decorated with carvings in the medieval Gothic manner. Medieval buildings in Western Europe Cathedrals, including Notre Dame, have peering down from them, clinging to edges and ledges, projections carved of stone in the form of people, animal, and fantastic beasts. Thank you, Sherry. Some of these carvings are gargoyles. Gargoyles are elaborate water spouts. They get their name from the old French for throat and relate it to our word gargle. They stick out so the rainwater may spew from their mouths and away from the roof and foundation. Stone carvers decorated these gutters with the form of fantastic animals and people who are roaring, spitting, and vomiting the water of any ordinary gutters. But the stone cutters didn't stop with gutters and began sprinkling magical figures and faces throughout the architecture of cathedrals, churches, town halls, and universities. 
When not constructed for drainage and only as ornament, these sculptures, these carvings are called grotesques. Now, some are frightening, dragon-like in appearance, and may have been created to ward off evil spirits. But many do not inspire dread as much as amusement. The carvers who cut them may be poking fun at the church or the scholastics who hired them. The carvings are foolish creatures, pulling their mouths, blowing raspberries, sticking out their tongues. So struck was I that I began searching for and acquiring replicas of some of these carvings. I began collecting. They are not easily had. And the images that you are looking at are replicas all hanging above windows and door frames in my home. That said, I do recall once when one of you was visiting my home and you lingered over one. Next slide, please. You politely said to me, Marta, I think they are an acquired taste. Maybe so. Thankfully, my fiance, Charlie, shares my sense of play. And as you approach his office, you can look up. Next slide, please. There above the door, you will find a smiling nose picker. Next slide, Sherry. Now, let me assure you, I remain a minister of some gravitas. Thank you, Sherry. Play is necessary for children to grow and to evolve. Sigmund Freud wrote about the essential role of play in emotional development, that is free play play that is voluntary and directed by the participants themselves, which is to say that violin lessons and organized soccer generally do not qualify. Those activities are supervised and directed by an adult. But when kids jam with friends or take part in a pickup soccer game, that's free play, like 10-year-old girls playing Scrabble or young David Whitford improvising alternate rules for baseball. The absence of adults means children have to figure out how to take turns and share. They have to work out how to obtain voluntary participation from everyone, how to enforce the rules, resolve disputes with no help from a referee, and then vary the rules or the norms of play when special situations arise, such as the need to include a much younger sibling in the game. Alas, starting in the 1980s, children became ever more supervised and lost opportunities to engage in free play in our American society. Free play helps teach children to handle challenges and to recover from failures. Without enough free play, experts say we now see more students in high school and college experiencing anxiety and depression. And there are additional implications. Some attribute the depth of our current political division to the lack of free form play over the last 40 years. We do not know well enough how to get along and work things out. Now, play is not just for children. Across the generations, play activates the brain, promoting growth of neurons. Play increases cognitive skills like critical thinking. Adults who play perform better academically and are more productive. Adults who take time to play have a more innovative attitude to life. Playing as an adult reduces stress, 
promotes optimism, and strengthens our ability to take on other perspectives. During a pandemic, play may have been low on our list of priorities, but times are changing. And today's temperatures tell us that summer is upon us. But whatever the season, play is a basic human need as essential to our well being as sleep. Over time, play deprivation, isn't that a great term? Play deprivation reveals itself in our getting cranky rigid, feeling stuck in a rut, or victimized by life. Play deprivation, experts say, even leads to criminal and pathological behavior. To benefit from play, we need to incorporate it in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, people play in different ways. Karaoke may sound like a blast to one person, and a nightmare to another. But pick anything that is lighthearted, that allows you to improvise. Do it alone or with others. It matters not. Play can be anything that brings you joy without offering a specific result. That means taking a bike ride because it's fun, not because you're trying to lose weight. Consider playfulness a practice, something you may need to remind yourself to do until you don't. How do you play? How will you play this day? Will you pick up an adult coloring book? Will you rollerblade or play a harmonica? Dance in the kitchen while you cook dinner? Read something that makes you laugh while you're in the grocery line? belt out a song during a drive home. Play can be similar to prayer and meditation in that it helps us focus on where we are in the moment. It can reset our busy minds. The last grotesque I will show you today hangs in the shower in my home. Slide, please, Sherry. This grotesque, exaggerated in his oh my goodness look, invites me in the bathroom to a playful and affirming humility. A function of religion is to help us situate ourselves to help us locate ourselves, to put our lives and ourselves in perspective. And the fallacy of some religions and certainly of materialistic culture is to assert that we are the center of the universe. Grotesques from medieval cathedrals remind me every day that life and religion need not be serious all the time. After all, Jesus's first miracle was a party trick, pure fun, wine from water, and at a wedding, no less. It's a parable of abundance and beauty and mystery and needless splendor. It's about life and blessing and joy. What if at times life is meant to be a playful romp? There is biblical precedence for such a notion. The 104th Psalm describes God as making the sea creatures specifically for women and men to play with. The book of Proverbs describes Lady Wisdom, Sophia, playing with God in the act of creation. I was your delight day by day, playing before you all the while playing on the surface of this earth, and I found delight in the children. The words of Proverbs. Thank you, Sherry. About 20 years ago, 
I attended a residential program for training as a spiritual director. For eight weeks, I stayed in a convent south of San Francisco. Each week, the team of instructors produced a schedule for us with slots for lectures, seminars, and supervised in-training sessions in which we offered people in the neighborhood spiritual direction. On the last week, remember this was an eight week program, the schedule was distributed and one day was blank. The words for that day said, play date with God. Of course, we asked what could that mean? The instructors smiled. They said, you must engage the day on your own, not in groups, and you must not interrupt anyone else's play. Figure it out. It is a day for you to play with God. It was one of the most delightful days of my life. What do I remember? sitting in the sun, following whatever whim came my way, eating fresh snap peas, coloring and walking and taking a shower in the middle of the day. What would you do with a day or even an hour on your calendar marked as a play date with God? This is what I will do tomorrow. Mondays are my weekly day off. I am heading to the beach. And this is the spirit I plan to bring to the beach. Next slide, Sherry. This is a painting by the contemporary artist, Marsha Burt. She paints acrylics on location. Painting on location requires that an artist gather important details about light and color and shape quickly because outdoor conditions can change rapidly. The time constraint has proved to be liberating for an artist committed to capturing the essence of a moment. And here I believe Marsha Burt has captured such a moment in this painting. She calls it arrival. We see the wide embrace of the child arriving at the water in play. Next slide and the last one, Sherry. When I first saw this painting, I thought of a mother and child. But when I recall my assignment years ago of enjoying a play date with God, I think, ah, yes, that's what it was like. Companioned gently, quietly by a spirit standing by while I romped in creation. I wonder, where will you romp this day or the next and the next? Thank you, Sherry. I close with a simple call this day. Play, be playful, for therein lies a saving grace. Amen.